services today. Thank you. Services as we continue with Bible study on Tuesday with John, and he should be finishing off Nehemiah. He hasn't done it right now, he's going to run out of time because it's the last day of uh, February. So if you want to read ahead, Nehemiah chapter 13, Wednesday morning, coffee morning at 10, and the two clubs of children, 5.30 and 6.30 Wednesday evening. Um, an elders meeting with the church elders on Thursday this week, rather than Friday, for various reasons. And a little advance notice there that the following Friday, the 10th of March, will be the church AGM, the church members. Next Sunday morning begins with communion at 10 o'clock, so 10 o'clock rather than 10.15, the communion service of the month. 11 o'clock, the family service of the John's taken. And the evening service, 6.30, Colin Robinson. Some of Dad knows. Someone that Andrew already asked about who he was. I said, like, I don't know. I've never met him yet. Yeah. I should meet him next Sunday evening. Yeah. So someone new coming to preach. So let's pray for those services and the preparation for them. Also, your prayers continue to remember the Bible studies. If Dad's unable to go down sometimes, they, they have started doing them themselves, which is really encouraging to think that these men are meeting together to study God's Word. So let's continue to pray for those Bible studies on a Monday in the prison. And obviously, when we look around the world, Situations like Ukraine, Turkey, Syria, persecuted country Christians, countries like Nigeria, we realize the world needs our prayers, doesn't it? As a church around the world, there's lots of hurting areas that need prayers of other credit Christians. Do you remember them in our prayers as well? Thank you again, Peter. It's lovely to be with you today, and I trust that God will bless us this evening. I am somewhat concerned with the doctrine of this church in finishing off Nehemiah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's pray, shall we? Father, we just thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. We thank you for bringing us to yet another occasion when we can worship you and praise you for what you are. We just ask, Lord, for your blessing on all the things that Russell has brought our attention to, and in particular, Lord, that this church might develop and grow and be encouraged and encourage one another. Amen. We just ask, Lord, that for your blessing this evening, that as we read your word, as we sing your praises, we might be very conscious of you leading us into all truth, for we ask it in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, Russell has chosen the hymns for us, and uh, we're beginning with 552, and then we're going to move on to one of my favorites. I've got a copy of it in my Bible, and I keep it there. My faith has found a resting place. 552 to begin with then.
my mum would never sing when ends life transient dream. She always sang should because she didn't expect to die. But then she did at 58, uh, but she was ready for it, wasn't she? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the assurance that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to recognize before you again, Heavenly Father, just how wonderful a Savior he is. The fact that he was prepared to leave heaven and come to earth to be born as a babe, to live among us, to know what it was to hurt, to suffer, to know what it was to walk among the sinful world in which he walked at that time. And Lord, it just seems to have got worse and worse. And yet our Lord was prepared to go to Calvary for us and there to take upon himself our sin, to die that we might be forgiven to die to open up the way for us to enter heaven. And even at that moment as he was there upon the cross, one alongside him said, Lord, remember me. And we thank you, Father, that our Lord Jesus Christ is still prepared to remember us. We recognize that he knows every one of us. We don't know how, it's beyond our comprehension but such is his greatness, his majesty, and his power that he knows everyone who calls out to him in repentance and faith. And so we come yet again to you, Father, and ask that you will bless us this evening as we think of what Jesus has done for us and what the future holds for us. And we believe that the Lord Jesus is coming again. When he does, we pray that each one of us who's gathered here this evening, and we would include our families as well, Lord, that each one might be ready for him when he comes or he calls. For we ask this in and through his precious name. Amen. 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 623. 623. <coughs> my faith has found a resting place. From guilt my soul is freed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. 623. <laughs>
tremendous words really, are they? I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough. Enough. That's it. It's enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. There is often a case where people think that religion, as they call it, is all right. It's all right for you. It's all right for you. I'm glad you've got that crutch to hang on to. And I had it said to me, oh, religion's just a crutch, isn't it? Mm. But you see, it's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that counts. Mm. And every one of us knows what it is <coughs> to have a relationship with someone or another. Maybe, you know, husband, wife, maybe friend, maybe just a sibling or children or whatever. And we have relationships in all sorts of directions. But there's only one Jesus. Mm. And we can all know him. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. I just think that's amazing. The fact that Jesus died for me. I'm always reminded when I'm thinking of that, of a very famous preacher who was invited to go to America and uh, was <coughs> to address a uh, Bible college forget what they call it, where they have the end of term, passing out parade sort of thing, you know. And he got up to speak, and he said, Jesus loves me. This I know. And the Bible tells me so. And he sat down, and he left him with that. That was it. And that's probably the most important thing anyone of us can ever know, that Jesus loves me. And when I was a, a little boy, I knew what it was to ask the Lord Jesus into my heart and life, to become not just my Lord, my Saviour, but my Lord. Right? And uh, when we've been singing about this, we need no other argument in Him. He's the one who fulfills our deepest need, isn't He? Now, some of you will have thought, well, we're going to be reading from uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We will be referring to it a little later. But to begin with, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, from verse 17. Our theme is the little thought that comes from Hebrews 11, uh, weakness turned to strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. For Christ, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and uh, he's uh, writing about the Lord Jesus. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. <clears throat> Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. 
Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. <coughs> that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in men's wisdom, but on God's power. Amen? Amen. Amen. Mm. Yeah, praise the Lord. Let's sing our next hymn together then. It's uh, old, So You Would Come. Now, I don't know this one, Russell. So you'll have to teach me this one. <laughs> slightly as well. 
Everything was done so you could come. As one as would. Because there were some in the Bible who became the could nots, you know. Because they would not. And I said to the would nots, think about it. Father, we just pray that each one of us might have experienced that moment when we have come to the Lord Jesus. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens to me, I will come in. We thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy with our Lord Jesus Christ. We trust that you will speak through your word to us this evening. Grant us your blessing for his sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I don't exactly remember the date, um, but when I was both ordained and inducted on one day into the church of which I became the pastor, and I was there for 17 and a half years, I read those verses that we read in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaim to you a testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. They are really powerful words from such an amazing apostle as the apostle Paul. And uh, I still feel that way today. After all, these what appears to me to be donkey's years in the ministry. But I'm thankful that God has blessed and encouraged now I want to turn over briefly to Hebrews chapter 11 because I promised I would. And in Hebrews chapter 11 we have what is commonly known as the faith chapter. And uh, we have so many people who are named in that particular passage. And some of course we discovered this morning. Uh, others aren't named but are hinted at or at least the, the deeds that they got involved in are... are uh, tabulated for us, um, but I want just to refer again to verse 34 of Hebrews chapter 11. We are told that some of them were uh, es escaped the edge of the sword, but then in between two semicolons we have this little, well that's in my Bible at least, uh, whose weakness was turned to strength. Mm -hmm whose weakness was turned to strength. Now, let's ask ourselves how this applies to Christian service, shall we? Most of those in Hebrews chapter 11 had or had some weakness or insecurity about them. Take, for instance, Abraham. God promised him a son through whom eventually we know our Lord Jesus was born. But of course, Abraham had his doubts. I'm an old man, and Sarah, well, she's well past bearing. And yet God said, this is what I'm going to do, and that is what he did. So even Abraham had his doubts. And then Moses probably the greatest man in the history of the people of Israel, Moses, well, he had his doubts, didn't he? He had his insecurities. And I want to take you back to Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, we discover Moses out in the wilderness. He spent 40 years there looking after his father-in-law's sheep, so he was a shepherd. Now there's an interesting thought. Have you ever gone through scripture to discover how many shepherds God used? He used dozens of them. And of course, the last sort of shepherds that are mentioned are those that came to the, uh, the stable to see the Lord Jesus. But who was the greatest shepherd? I am the shepherd of the sheep. John 10.10 10 tells us that uh, he came as a shepherd so that we might have life and have it to the full. The greatest shepherd. So God used shepherds throughout history. That's an interesting study. That's one that uh, John might do at some time or another and maybe finish them off. 
We never know. <laughs> we never know. But sometimes as you, you look at themes as you go through the Bible, you discover some wonderful, another theme for you, the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You begin back in Genesis to discover lambs. And go all the way through the scripture to discover. I digress because we're looking at Moses, aren't we? And Moses is shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law way out in the desert, miles away from anywhere, having run away because he killed an Egyptian, remember? And the two Israelites who were fighting, they must have passed the word on somewhere or another. And Moses thought he was going to be okay. And then suddenly somebody said, who, who are you? You killed somebody. And so Mer Moses is a murderer. And yet God used him. Transformation took place in Moses' life when God met him. And God speaks to him from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And he has a wonderful, marvelous experience. Wouldn't you have liked a burning bush experience with God? Wouldn't you? Oh, that would have set you up for the rest of your life, wouldn't it? What does Moses say? Oh, I don't know so much. It worries me. What am I going to tell them? How am I going to... And if you look at verse 11 of uh, Exodus 3, if you happen to turn to it, uh, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? There's a personal modesty perhaps here, but some doubt at his own abilities. Oh, dear, dear, dear. I will be with you, says God. I'll be with you. But Moses makes another excuse in verse 13 of Exodus 3. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? So theologically he knew very little. He didn't know very much about God. After all, he had been educated in the Egyptian gods. He'd been educated in the Egyptian universities. But now he's meeting, as it were, face to face with God. And he, he doesn't know. So there's theological ignorance about it. And God says, tell them I am who I am. Very phrase now. There's another one you might do a theme on looking up the I am's as you go through scripture, and you'll find eventually the Lord Jesus says to those who came to arrest him, Who are you looking for? Well, we're looking for Jesus, isn't that? I am, he says. I am. And then, of course, going to chapter 4 of Exodus, and uh, God is still encouraging Moses. Uh, but Moses says in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Exodus, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So there was a fear of failure. He had all these doubts and fears about him. And then if I turn over the page, still continuing in chapter 4 of Exodus, we can look at Moses again, this time in verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. <coughs> I haven't got any gifts. I can't get up there at the front and say anything. I can't do it. And so Moses was worried about those lack of gifts. And God says to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or dumb? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? No, go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lord. No, 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 no. He didn't say that. He said, oh, Lord, please, please send someone else to do it. Please send someone. If you've got someone else up your sleeve, I think he would be the better person. God says, look, I've chosen you. God's anger burned against Moses. This is the Moses that the people of Israel revered and still do revere. The man who said, Lord, send someone else. And God did have someone else up his sleeve. Of course, it was Aaron who was to speak on behalf of Moses. I will help you both to speak and I will teach you what to do. So there you are. Moses, who is contained and is written quite a bit about in Hebrews chapter 11, is one of those who had a great deal of doubt. He felt a great deal of weakness. He was not ready for it. And then if we go into the New Testament, we discover that the Lord Jesus chose 12 disciples. They came from a variety of employments. Several of them were fishermen, of course, as you know. But each of them had something that needed sorting out in one way or another. Have you ever thought about that? Would you have chosen that bunch of men? I got told off once for calling a, a congregation a mob. <laughs> but they were a bit of a mob, weren't they? Those 12 disciples. Think about it. There was the impulsive Peter. Oh, you can't do that, Lord. No, 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 no. Get behind me, Satan. And then there was the doubting Thomas. Oh, no, I can't believe that. Not until I put my hand into his side and my finger into his, into his wounds. No, no, no. And then there was questioning Philip. Hadn't Jesus made it clear enough in John's Gospel that I am the way, the truth, and the life? Philip, don't you believe me yet? Haven't you been with me for such a long time, Philip? Three years he'd been listening to the Lord Jesus, approximately, and still he hadn't got the message. Well, aren't you and I the same? Questioning Philip. And what about the ambitious James and John? Or maybe their mother was ambitious for them. Well, let them sit at your right hand and your left hand when you get into your kingdom. That's not for me to give, says the Lord Jesus. That's for someone else. So there we are, you see. You've got these characters. Oh, wonderful disciples. And eventually, of course, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, they are transformed. You run a character study between some of the, uh, the disciples, in particular the Apostle Peter, and see the change from the end of John's Gospel to the end of chapter 2 of Acts, when he has preached the Word of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. What a change had come about him. So if God can do that for Moses, if he can do it for his disciples, there's hope for us, isn't there? Do you only think so? There's hope for us. Now, some of you may have heard of a man called James Hudson Taylor. I was speaking to some young people the other day, and uh, I was talking about mission. And a cousin of mine went out to China and spent several years there working in China, but uh, he never learnt the language. And I thought that was rather strange. It was always done through a translator. Whereas Hudson Taylor set about translating the scriptures into the languages that he was dealing with. And in the early 1800s, of course that's a long time ago now, so maybe we've forgotten history, he established the China Inland Mission. And eventually, and the one thing I was interested to discover was that um, <laughs> We've been talking about trying to remember names today. Um, Muller, George Muller, 
financially supported the China Inland Mission. That's a link. Two people you've got to look at. <laughs> George Muller and Hudson Taylor. And eventually they had over 200 missionaries working in inland China in that day. Many of them died, particularly during the Boxer Rebellion. But this is what Hudson Taylor wrote. The Lord was looking for a man weak enough to use, and he found me. That touched me when I read it the first time. The Lord was looking for a man weak enough to use, and he found me. Are you weak enough? We come with all sorts of backgrounds and abilities, different educations and so on, but are we prepared to be molded in the way that our Lord Jesus wants us? to be molded? Are we to fit into his pattern? Are we weak enough? <coughs> now going back to Moses for a moment, I want to turn to Numbers, and this time to Numbers chapter 12. And here in Numbers chapter 12, poor old Moses faces a rebellion. Now, quite often, pastors face rebellions in churches. I've known a number of my colleagues in the past who have had difficulties within their churches, but this is not anything to do with the church. This is his family. Miriam, that's his sister, and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife for he had married a cushion. And their egos come to the fore here. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. And it's so easy within families to have problems and have difficulties because of ego. I'm better than him or her. I'm better educated. I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. No, God doesn't want that. I want you to notice in uh, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3. Now Moses was a very humble man more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Isn't that an amazing testimony? The humility of Moses is recorded in Scripture. Something else I want to draw your attention <coughs> to is this. God then says, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? With him I speak face to face. So when the Lord Jesus took those apostles up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and there appeared Moses and Elijah, it was not the first time that Moses had seen him. In his weakness and his humility, Moses was given the privilege of personal audiences with the Lord. Wouldn't you like that? 
dear lady whom uh, I knew very well. Her husband died, in fact, he died on his kitchen floor with me holding his hand as he died and I, I committed him and commended him to the Lord and then she moved into a sheltered accommodation and she said to me, I kept the same bed as we used to sleep in, she said, and one day, or one night it must have been, she said that I stretched across the bed and it was war, it was war. She said, of course it wasn't Gus, that was her husband. She said, it was Jesus. She felt the presence of the Lord in such a real way. And what a privilege that is to have a personal audience with the Lord Jesus. There will always be those who exploit the, the apparent weakness, seeking to boost their own ego, just like Aaron and Miriam did. But if we are <coughs> useful, and to be useful in the Lord's service, there is no room for egotistical behavior. When once our resistance to the call of the Lord is broken down, then what wonderful things God can do with the weak and the despised. That's why we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we did. God uses the things that are weak to make things strong. Now, look again at Moses. When uh, Moses was there in the desert, what has he got with him? Well, it's just the clothes that he stands up in and his sandals, which he had to take off his feet because he was standing on holy ground. But what else has he got? A staff. What sort of staff was it? It was a shepherd's staff. I don't know whether it would have had a crook like the modern day shepherds use, but it was certainly a shepherd's staff and would have been recognized as such. Do you know that the Egyptians hated shepherds? Mm -hmm. So there he arrived in front of Pharaoh holding a shepherd's staff, obviously a shepherd, stank a sheep. What does God say? You just take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. Moses, what have you got in your hand? Now I'm going to ask you and I'm going to put you on the spot. What have you got in your hand? Now, I don't mean literally. If you think about it, what have you got that can be used for the service of God? It's Ben, young Ben. Very capable. God has given the ability for him to project things which I wouldn't know how to do. What have you got in your hand? Well, I've got a computer. Fine. That's what God's using. That's a blessing in itself. Russell, any good at playing the keyboard, Russell? Well, I think you are. God says, I'll use that. Eh? So I'm just picking on two people. Sorry about that, but others have got abilities and giftings, some natural, some spiritual, that God uses to his glory and to our blessing. What is that in your hand, Moses? It's a staff, Lord. Well, I'm going to use that then. And so we go through that wonderful chapter in Hebrews 11 and we discover others. Gideon, what have you got? Ah, but, uh, well, I'm the least among my, my family and, uh, you know, my, my tribe is very small and, and I haven't got any of it. What, what have you got? Well, I've got this earthenware pot. Well, that's fine. We'll put a lamp in it and we'll deal with the Midianites with that, won't we? Yes. What have you got in your hand? An earthenware pot. 
He was scared. Of course he was. And sometimes we are scared when God calls us into particular things. I remember when I was first called into full-time ministry, I was scared. What happens if I make a mistake? What happens if I get it all wrong? And the Lord says, what have I put in your hand? And Gideon, he had that jar. Samson, he's there in Hebrews 11 as well. Samson, what have you got? <coughs> All I've got left is this donkey's jawbone. Oh dear, what he did with that was unaccountable. Amazing. David, young David this is. David, what have you got? Well, I've got a sling. I've got five stones. That's what I'll use then, says God. And you and I are the same. Whatever we have, God, by his grace and mercy, can use to his glory. Now, God never, ever uses the unclean thing. So if what we have, we have concerns about, get rid of it. And ask God to cleanse us and give us that which his, he will use. The thing is that he uses the weak, as we read in 1 Corinthians, he uses the foolish, he uses the despised. Do you recognize yourself in that? Well, I am always a bit foolish. I've been one of those who wears my heart on my sleeve, sadly, and uh, I cry in the pulpit occasionally, as you know. And I don't mind, if you don't mind, because that's the way God moves me. But if God uses the weak and the foolish and the despised, well that opens the door for all of us, doesn't it? And if resistance is gone, God will use us. Don't reach the point when God gets angry with you, as he did with Moses. Don't reach the point when God is talking to Gideon and says, now come on, I can do this by my power, not yours. Don't do that. Don't resist if God is calling you into some particular work or ministry of one thing or another. You know what it will be. Only you can know because God speaks to us individually and directly through his word. So what does it require? Well, first of all, if we don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior, there needs to be re repentance to turn from what we were to what we should be looking to him. And then we need faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And our ego must be relinquished. And all we have must be placed at his disposal. And then, and only then, out of our weakness, he will make us strong. Won't he? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you can take what is ours that you have given to us already and use us to your glory. We confess before you, Father, that we come with our weaknesses, with our inabilities, and ask that you will make us strong. Strong in the power that you can give us through the Holy Spirit. So bless us, we pray, Lord as we sing our final hymn, in the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. amen. My hope is built on nothing less, we're going to sing. <coughs> it's a new tune, is that right? Yep.
just thank you for such a wonderful Savior as Jesus. Mm -hmm. We ask that each one of us might have experienced his presence, his power, so that one day we might see him face to face as he takes us to be with him. Grant this, we ask, and also that we might know your peace, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and your presence, Lord, day by day as you have promised, for we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 